Hello and welcome to the Squeaky Bum Time Podcast, presented exclusively on the Chop Sports Channel of the Premier Streaming Network. We are recording this on Thursday, June 1st, 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 1st. I am your host, Laurent Cortines. In this episode, we review the Europa League final, Jose Mourinho and his madness, and get into the FA Cup preview. But first, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of the show. Uh, We're getting to the nitty-gritty part of the season, and I wanted to uh, let everybody know that you can follow us on TikTok, you can follow us on Facebook, and please like and subscribe to the show. It means everything to us. We're on squeakybumtime.com, and we are on Laurent1056 on Instagram. I'm making little videos, uh, reels of little things, and it would mean everything if you would subscribe to the show, wherever you find it, and get involved. Let's get to our first game. Let's review the Europa League final between Sevilla and Roma. Sevilla, seven, six-time champions coming into this, and Jose Mourinho boasting that he had never lost a European final. So there was an inevitable clash of history, which force would break first uh i don't know the saying uh the inevitable force of this force of that i don't know what it is but what we had was the worst possible (laughs) the worst possible situation which was roma scoring a goal first through dibala dibala who has been injury riddled for most of the season told Mourinho he only had about 20 minutes in him but he came out and played anyway so good for him very cool on his part um, and then um, what we knew would happen is that Mourinho would park the bus, which he did. And we saw Sevilla slowly but surely grow into the game. Uh, second half, it was a game of two halves. Sevilla really didn't do much in the first half after that beautiful Dybala goal on 34, by assisted by Mancini. And then, of course... You know, there were changes made. Suso comes on. Lamela comes on all in this right after halftime. And Lamela and Suso changed everything. Became a much more attacking side. Sevilla back on the front foot. What's weird about this tournament is Sevilla are like the Real Madrid of the Europa League. <laughs> Something with the Spaniards. They have these weird, wonderful attachments to these tournaments that they start to believe that no matter what is going on in their season, like Sevilla were in the relegation zone, they had nothing, they had three managers, their manager had been, the only thing he'd ever won was, you know, Segunda B League in Spain, and he comes in and he turns this team around, and they are here in the Europa League final after, you know, beating famously Manchester United. Uh, his name, The manager is Mendilbar, Mendilibar, uh, against the great and powerful Jose Mourinho. There's so many uh, Premier League old boys between these two teams. You've got um, Telus on loan from, from Manchester United. Rakitic, well, he never played, but Navas and Fernando, both former Manchester City players. Brian Hill from Spurs in this game. That That's just the Sevilla side, along with, I believe, and Lamella, of course, from... Uh, from Spurs, all these players on this side. And then on the Roma side, we have Nomad Nematic, we have uh, Tammy Abraham, Chris Smalling, Roy Patricio uh, on the bench. No, no, no one, no one particularly uh, Premier League. Diego Lorente, I think, would probably be the other one. But, you know, so just some players that we hadn't seen for a while. We wonder where we were. Here they are in Spain uh, doing well. But the second half belonged to Sevilla. Roma sitting back. Roma doing what Roma does until an amazing cross by Navas becomes an own goal in the 55th minute. And then somehow, you know, unfortunately, Roma has to try and score a goal, but they take off Dybala, who was the only attacking force they had in the whole team, comes on for Wijnaldum, a name I forgot, old boy, uh, on loan. Uh, and nothing really happens for the rest of the game. There is a lot of card yelling. Uh, Mourinho's going nuts. The card imbalance, I think 
Roma has six cards, has five or six cards to to um, to Roma's three. So it's a bit of a choppy game. And this is how Roma wanted it. This was, it didn't matter anymore about what happened. Let's look at the cards. Okay, Sevilla ends up with one, two, three, four, five, six cards, whereas Roma ends up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cards. So you can imagine this game was fouls. This was bitty. They were throwing themselves on the ground. This was all about shit housing. This was all about winning. This was all about Mourinho. It was played the way Mourinho wanted it, and he got his game all the way through with 10 minutes of added time after extra time. So they played 130 minutes of football in this game, and it was nasty. It was bitty. Guys were fighting on the sidelines, and it was enjoyable, I have to say, for the lack of football in it, it was very dramatic. <laughs> uh, Rakitic, there were a couple shots off the woodwork here, specifically Smalling late in the 130th minute. He headed it off the line. He was Roma's best player. He was fantastic. Uh, his shot of a low quality. Tammy Abraham had the best shot, and he just flat missed it, and it was saved but he had the highest quality shot. There were not a tremendous amount of high quality opportunities. I'd say the best one was Abraham's uh, and of course the Bala's, but otherwise not too many extra ones. Uh, and like I said, a couple balls off the woodwork here or there. Lots of block shots as well, but an enjoyable game that ended up going to penalties, which is what Mourinho wanted. And then inexplicably, Mourinho sends out of the first penalties are taken, Ocampos makes his, uh, Brian Cristante makes his, but then it's Mancini and Ibanez for Roma, two defenders who don't make theirs. And so um, Roma don't get their best penalty takers onto the field. Uh, it's over before it starts. They miss two in a row. Uh, the hero of the, World Cup, of the World Cup, Bono, he makes the saves. And Sevilla win the Europa League. Okay. We knew that <laughs> we knew that Mourinho was going to go ape shit. I mean, you just knew it. He does not accept losing. He's the successful he's the Donald Trump personality of world football. He simply does not accept losing and he won't say that he lost and he won't be magnanimous about it. He went after um is it Bobby Madley? Uh Yes. Oh, sorry. He goes after Anthony Taylor after the game. And then the Roma ultras are going after him the following day as he tries to get on a plane and go home. Italian football just has this thing. Uh, European football has this thing with referees. They feel like it's their birthright to do these sorts of things. And it's disgusting. Uh, and Mourinho is just the worst. He, you know, he does get credit for getting teams to finals. He takes his shot at Spurs in the press conference before, uh, you know, attacking them and saying, oh, you know, I, I felt affinity for every team I played for, except for Spurs, and they fired me before I had a chance to go to a final. Not remembering how shit he was, how much he was throwing players into the bus, how much he was destroying people's confidence. But of course, you know, it's Spurs' fault. Anyway, fuck you, Jose Mourinho. I'm glad you lost uh, Sevilla with their seventh European Europa League Cup. That's really something else. Think about it. Real Madrid have been talking shit about their 14 um, European Cups, but they won five in the first six years. So really they have nine. Sevilla have won these seven uh, Cups in like 15 years. It's amazing. Uh, Unai Emery had won most of them, but this is a big win for Sevilla. They gets them into the Champions League and keeps Roma out. Uh, this is a sad state for Roma. They really needed this. And had they made the Champions League and won this game, Mourinho probably would have stayed for the recruitment purposes. But now that he now that he um, has lost this game, he'll probably complain his way out of Roma and try and get himself another job. Rumors are PSG. That would be a fucking catastrophe if they still have Neymar and if they still have Mbappe. But who the fuck knows? But, you know, he rebuilds himself. He goes down the chain. Shows he's a winner again, goes back up the chain. So we'll see what Mourinho's luck is for this one. So we have that. We still have 
two more European finals. Let's just keep in mind, we still have the Europa Conference League of, um, I believe, Florentina and West Ham are playing in that one. So that's the junior junior. This is just the junior. Um, and then which Mourinho won last year, the first inaugural. So this was one of his little like crowning achievements that he won the Europa Conference League with Roma. And now he's tried to win the Europa League with Roma. So we have that going on. Europa Conference League, yes, June 7th uh, is West Ham versus Fiorentina. I would imagine Fiorentina are the favorites here. A uh, bit more history. Uh, had a better season in Syria, finishing ninth uh, with a winning record at least, whereas Spurs had to battle their way through the kind of till the end of the season. We're kind of in a relegation zone uh, under Moyes, but they are just as good a chance to to pull this out as as um as as Fiorentina, but they had only forty points. Fiorentina fifteen points more, 15, thirteen points more than West Ham. But so that's the Europa Conference League. Then we have the Europa League. We have the Champions League final in two weeks. Uh, and, of course, we have the dreaded second leg of the treble. We get into it now. A Manchester derby at Wembley. Manchester City versus Manchester United. Everything statistically and record-wise, and everything says that City should have this game. It is, you know, City are the superior team. City are the ball-playing team. City are Premier League champions on 89 points. But United have history on their side. United will have the crowd on their side at Wembley. This is a big game. And they will have the history weighing on them of the 99 Manchester United team that won the trouble. Manchester United, the only team to win the trouble uh, ever in English football history. So for them, this game, as much as it means a lot to Manchester City to win the trouble, this game means more for United as an institution versus City as an institution. City's goal is... The European Cup is the Champions League final. This game is not the be-all and end-all. It is the historical moment. But if you want to think mentality of what it means, I think in this case, this game means a little bit more to Manchester United fans as a whole than it does for the players. This The players all just want to win. Uh, in their last meeting was the world-famous Rashford was offside goal where United won 2-1. Uh, City suffered, but City were not in their cityness yet. <laughs> if I had a better way to say it, they were kind of, you know, still finding their way after they had pumped them earlier in the season with the double hat tricks by Foden and Holland. So uh, they had they got their redemption in the early rounds. Yeah, six three. But the thing about the early game in the season was that United did score the three goals all in the second half. Uh, interesting there, but City destroys United. That's one of those early games where United's got to go, we're not quite there yet. These are these moments that Ten Hag was learning about his team, uh, feeling them out after the first two games, tries to play with the with the Bruno, Eriksson, no Casemiro team, and it just doesn't go well. If I'm looking at the, the 6-3, it is, yeah, it's Eriksson, McTominay, that's what it was, uh, two-man midfield. And that didn't work because there was no um, there was no Casemiro just yet. He comes on late. I think that was his first game. And the second half was much better for United at the time. But yeah, Foden and Grealish with the hat tricks. This was a masterclass by City at this time. Not our best defense. Cancelo was still on the team. Uh, it was Ake and Cancelo. I did not feel good about that. If I remember, anytime Ake was on the team, I was petrified and thought City would blow it. But this was one of those moments where City found the gear. Um, and then the second game was the 2-1 with the Rashford offside, not offside, VAR, terrible call, where United at home, which they had done all season, played really, really well and um, did get the points they needed. Uh, Rashford, if you recall, the ball's played to him. He leaves it. He's very, very, very close to touching the ball. But then um, I believe Fernandez comes onto it hits it, 
Then on four minutes later, Rashford scores the final goal with Jack Grealish putting it early, putting City up one nil. I do remember these games, but uh, it, it was it was dodgy at the time. <laughs> the the no touch, then of course letting Bruno pick it up and score the goal. But in this case, it's Fred and Casemiro. And if I remember this game really well, Fred was fantastic in this game. Shaw's in the midfield with, Ver- I mean, Shaw's in defense with, um, with Varane and Wambasaka is there. So whenever uh, United play defensive, they're much, much, much better. I would expect that that's what they do in the final. So we're on to what happened now for the actual preview of the game. You know, you'd expect City will play their their three two, their three four three that they've been playing, or three three two four one, or whatever it is, with uh, the three man backfield is Ake Diaz Akanji with Stones and Rodri in the midfield, and Grealish and Silva out wide with Gundogan and De Bruyne playing the two free eights and Holland up front. Uh, I would assume um, that United will play with. Erickson and Casemiro with Sancho, Fernandez, Rashford. Uh, there's no Anthony, so we'll see Sancho or Garnacho in there, and then Wambasaka and Shaw in defense with Varane and um, and and Lindelof. Um, City don't really have any injuries, but players have been saying that they're exhausted or tired. I don't know if that's gamesmanship or drunkmanship that Pep's been saying. You know, City have lost and drew on their last two games since they won the title uh, for United. You know, really the issues are Sabitzer's not available. We know Lissandro did his Achilles and then Anthony Marshall, which is actually a good thing, is out. And then Anthony was stretchered off with a bad ankle. So that sort of solves some of the attacking problems that Ten Hag tends to have. And I think with Garnacho, they're better anyway. So we'll see Fernando's floating. Hopefully Sancho and Garnacho will... We'll start trouble and do things. But the only thing I'd be concerned for with United is how the hell are they going to get the ball? Because Erickson doesn't run. Um, Casemiro cannot protect their weak back line as well as he thinks. And then, of course, City have so much attacking power. Um, Holland is going to target Lindelof because he's a little too short and see where that goes. Perhaps they'll play Shaw inside and try and use one of their other fullbacks. But I'm not quite sure what will happen. Um, But this is a big deal. Uh, City have not given up a goal in the FA Cup. They last won the FA Cup in a romp. If you recall, they scored six unanswered against Watford in, I think, Slavin Bilic's last game. And last time we saw Watford, uh, not really a moment of brilliance for them. But um, every time City go to Wembley, they lose. We've lost our last four trips. So that's not really a good sign. Uh, You know, United got to feel good getting through Brighton, um, even though they were probably outplayed. Uh, They haven't won the FA Cup since 2016. So trophies matter. They got their League Cup. Can they do a cup double, which would be cup double in the top four would be an amazing season for United. But the pressure, of course, is to prevent City from winning the treble. It is going to be a game that matters so much to United. And I think it's a question of how do they react to that? How do they feel about having that pressure? Do they just play it as another game? Do they try and sit tight and play on the break, which is basically United's best bet against City. If they try and play with City, they're going to get beat badly. I wonder if they go with the Fred and um, Casemiro midfield to have a bit more mobility, uh, or do they or do they try and play Erickson? I don't think this is a game for Erickson uh, because he just doesn't get around enough. He doesn't really close guys down. He's more of their attacking pick lock pick player. Yes, useful in the break, but how often is he going to have that opportunity? So that's the question I have there and then for city it's just can they regain that power and dominance that they showed in that first half versus real the perfect game um the most their most amazing performance probably of this era honestly to to dismantle an aristocratic club 
like Real Madrid and see if they can't find that strength inside them, that mentality to be like, I know you think you're going to stop us from winning the treble, but this is, but we're the greatest team of all time. And we're going to show you that we are. So to be humble, but aggressive, um, arrogant, but not, but, but appreciative, this kind of like that push pull of like city can go into the game saying we're the greatest team of all time, but we're going to show you versus we're the greatest team of all time. Get out of our way. Just a little subtle mentality where if city can get that right, perfect pitch of high energy, high attack, get the goal early, really put the United crowd in Wembley away and then go from there. I think United could really be in for a long day. I'm not sure what state United are in. I think they're good. I think that they've had a fine season. They are not in city's class and a loss for city would be a major disappointment to be fair, Um, a major disappointment. And I don't, like the idea of losing to United twice in a season. It would piss me off and I wouldn't like it. So fuck off. (laughs) Um, But that is the big game. That's where we are. We had our Europa League. We had our FA Cup final, which is coming up. Um, We talked about the Conference League. There are, we're starting to get the transfer rumor machine going. Players are moving around. Um, We've got, you know, best of lists, most underrated teams. So we're seeing the sort of wind down end of the season award type things that are going on. Um, And I am tired. I'm ready for the season to end, but I just want this treble to happen. And I want it to happen sooner rather than later. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. Some, some shows are bigger than others. That was the Squeaky Bum Time podcast with Laurent Cortines. We are the football wing of the Chop Sports Channel, presented exclusively by the Premier Streaming Network. We record on Mondays and Thursdays, so be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. And if you're listening on Apple or wherever you listen, please rate and review the show. It means everything. And follow along on Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, wherever you get, follow things, follow us. <laughs>